I'm delighted now to welcome our next uh, recipient of the Canada Gairdner International Prize, our laureate, uh, Dr. Michael Hall from the University of Basel in Switzerland. He joined the Biosyndrome of the University of Basel in, eight, uh, in 1987, where he's currently professor and a former chair of biochemistry. His award is for the discovery of the nutrient-activated protein kinase TOR and elucidation of its central uh, control of cell growth, critical to development and aging, and widely implement, implemented, implicated in cancers, diabetes, cardiovascular, and immune diseases. The impact of uh, Dr. Hall's discovery has contributed to a deeper understanding of fundamental life processes such as cell division, growth, and death. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Hall to the stage for his lecture entitled Tor Signaling in Growth and Metabolism. So thank you for the introduction, and uh, I'd like to start by saying it's, of, uh, it's indeed a, uh, a pleasure and, uh, needless to say, an honor to be uh, up here with the, uh, my fellow Gardner laureates to be giving a lecture today. So we work on cell growth, and in particular we work on the TOR signaling pathway. And what I'd like to do today is uh, is give you an overview of the TOR uh, field. I'll avoid showing any primary data. Uh, and this uh, overview will be relatively brief and will be largely uh, historical. And the first slide I'd actually uh, like to show you makes the point, gives you a really uh, broad view uh, of the uh, TOR signaling uh, pathway. Uh, so this over here is the very first ever model of TOR signaling published. It's one we published uh, shortly after discovering TOR in 1991. And I have to say I'm uh, actually embarrassed I published this model. Uh, I, I think of it more of as a Gary Larson cartoon these days than a, than a model, a scientific model. Uh, as you can see, there are more uh, question marks in here than actual useful information. And much of the information that's there is wrong. So. Uh, uh, essentially, all this model does is says TOR exists and nothing else. So, uh, uh, more recently, uh, uh, we have a, a model of TOR looks more like this, and even this is woefully out of date. Uh, we've stopped drawing models of TOR signaling. It's gotten so uh, complicated. Uh, and what's uh, driven this increase in complexity is this exponential increase in, uh, in publications in this area. Uh, and this, in turn, has been driven by the fact that uh, TOR turned out to be both clinically and fundamentally important, much more so than we suspected when we first stumbled across it back in 1991. So what I'd like to do is uh, briefly take you back to 1991, and by the end of my overview, I'll have you at a state of knowledge resembling uh, this over here. Now, the story actually started before 1991. It started in 1965 when a group of scientists, uh, actually from Canada, Montreal in particular, uh, set out for Easter Island, known as Rapa Nui, to the locals, and they were prospecting for exotic microbes which made novel secondary metabolites which could be developed into drugs, and they were looking for uh, antifungals. Uh, and they uh, found uh, uh, rapamycin as, uh, as, uh, as one of these secondary metabolites made by the soil bacteria in which they, which they isolated. Uh, and they started to develop as an antifungal, but realized it had an undesirable side effect of suppressing the immune system. Uh, and of course, this is the last thing you want to do to someone who has a, a fungal infection is to suppress the immune system. So it was rejected and forgotten for years. Uh, and uh, it was rediscovered later, as I'll come to later in the story. But if you actually go to Easter Island, you'll find a plaque which commemorates this auspicious act of picking up a handful of dirt. Uh, this is uh, a plaque uh, which is in Portuguese for reasons I don't fully understand. Uh, but what it says is that in this place was obtained a sample in January of 65 that allowed the isolation of rapamycin, a substance which ushered in a new era in transplantation surgery. So this, of course, reflects the fact uh, that uh, rapamycin was later developed as an immunosuppressive. So where it was rejected as a antifungal because it suppressed the immune system, in the intervening years, immunosuppression 
came into the clinic as a form of therapy, and then rapamycin was rediscovered and, re and then actually developed as a drug. Uh, so that's why it was, uh, became famous as an immunosuppressive early on. Now, um, I like this plaque because uh, to me it uh, very clearly uh, indicates the mysterious ways in which science advances. You never, uh, I don't think any would have, anybody would have predicted in 65 when they picked up that handful of dirt that it would lead to what it has led. So uh, this is what rapamycin actually looks like. Uh, uh, TOR, by the way, stands for a target of rapamycin. Uh, this is what TOR looks like, this uh, natural product made by this soil uh, bacterium. Uh, and it now has application in three major therapeutic areas. Whereas it was originally developed, as I said, as an immunosuppressive drug, it's now uh, more famous as an anti-cancer drug, and it's actually also used in the treatment of cardiovascular disease, uh, rest stenosis after angioplasty in particular. So I can also give you an overview of the uh, clinical uh, milestones of, of rapamycin. So it was approved, I'd like to show this to, to, to illustrate how recent much of this is. Uh, so it was originally uh, approved as an immunosuppressive in 1999. Uh, it was then approved for use in stents in the treatment of rest stenosis about 10 years ago. Uh, and then in 2007, it was uh, approved for use as an anti-cancer drug in the treatment of renal cell carcinoma uh, in particular. Uh, and this uh, is the market name of, uh, of rapamycin for uh, that's marketed by Pfizer, which is the company that bought Wyeth, which is the company that bought the company that sent those scientists to Rapa Nui back in 1965. So there's a very pleasing continuity to that story. Now, more recently, Novartis has, uh, has introduced its own version into the market, uh, uh, called, which they call uh, Affinitor, which is also used for, for cancer, for renal cell carcinoma and other uh, forms of cancer. So how did we discover uh, uh, TOR. Uh, uh, well, we did this uh, uh, genetically and we did it in yeast. And, there, and now you have to go back to the late 1980s when we were starting this work and you have to realize that rapamycin at that time was being developed as a immunosuppressive for use on humans. Uh, and my postdoc at the time by the name of Joe Heitman had the, uh, uh, in retrospect, brilliant idea to use yeast to go after the target of rapamycin. And all our colleagues raised their eyebrows and rolled their eyes because they said, why would you want to give this drug to a yeast cell? It's like giving aspirin to yeast. Uh, of course, what they all had forgotten in the meantime and what Joe had remembered was that rapamycin had originally been developed as, or uh, attempted to be developed as a antifungal. So everybody had forgotten that. Uh, so Joe had this sort of wonderful idea to use yeast. And of course, once you use yeast, you can use the uh, power of yeast genetics. And I think this is what uh, gave us the advantage uh, in the then very competitive area of trying to uh, uh, identify the mechanism of action of rapamycin and identify the target of, of, of rapamycin. So when Joe uh, selected rapamycin-resistant yeast mutants, he obtained mutants defective in any one of three different genes. Uh, the majority of the mutations were recessive in, and, uh, in the gene called FPR1. And this has a separate name from the other two genes because Joe had already characterized this gene in the context of his uh, ongoing project. And this gene encodes a protein called FKBP, which I'll tell you about in a moment. Uh, in addition to mutations in the FPR1 gene, we had mutations in these two other genes, which we then call TOR1 and TOR2, uh, for target of rapamycin. And we, of course, didn't know what they encoded. They're simply genetic uh, mutated loci uh, in the yeast genome. And these mutations were uh, extremely rare and dominant. So why did we have mutations in three genes? Why were some common and recessive and some very rare and dominant? Well, of course, back in uh, 1990, we didn't know the answer to these questions, but we now do. And it relates to the mechanism of action of rapamycin. This is how rapamycin works. So this is rapamycin, now drawn in a space-filling configuration. And it's a very lipophilic molecule, so it simply diffuses across the plasma membrane. Uh, therefore, there's no transporter which when mutated could confer resistance. And once inside the cell, it then forms a, a complex with this protein, very small protein, 12 kilodalton protein, called FKBP, which is the pro product of that FPR1 gene. And it's then this, uh, uh, this FKBP rapamycin uh, complex which has activity in the cell. So the FKBP is a sort of intracellular receptor or cofactor for rapamycin action. So rapamycin alone does nothing. That's why 
Uh, so any simple loss of function in the gene encoding FKBP or FPR1 gives complete rapamycin resistance. So that's why these mutations were very common and recessive. Uh, TOR, on the other hand, which is a very large protein, about 300 kilodaltons, this is a very small uh, segment of it, the so-called uh, rapamycin binding domain. Uh, and if we had the drawn the structure of the whole thing, it would probably fill most of this stage. Uh, Unlike FKBP, TOR is absolutely essential for cell viability and therefore can tolerate very little mutation. In fact, every mutation we obtained fell into the exact same codon, which uh, specified a residue in this alpha helix, which is a key contact site between TOR and rapamycin. And of course, the effect of these mutations was to confer complete uh, rapamycin resistance because FKBP rapamycin could no longer bind TOR. Uh, but these mutations otherwise didn't affect TOR activity. So this is why these mutations were extremely rare because they were confined to a single uh, codon. And of course they were dominant because they conferred resistance even in the presence of a wild type uh, TOR uh, gene. So what is uh, TOR? Uh, well once we cloned and, and sequenced the two TOR genes, uh, we found that the encoded uh, proteins were very highly uh, similar, uh, in fact 70 percent identical. Uh, and they turned out to be the founding members of this novel class of atypical protein kinases, serine threonine kinases in particular, all of which resemble lipid kinases, PI3 kinases, like you just heard uh, about from uh, Luke Cantley. Yet every member of this class is a, uh, is a uh, protein kinase. And to this day, we don't know the significance of this resemblance uh, to lipid uh, kinases. Since this uh, early discovery of TOR and yeast, uh, uh, TOR has now been found in every organism, all the way from, uh, from uh, yeast uh, to human. Also uh, uh, important to realize that TOR controls growth in many other physiological contexts, oftentimes independent of cell division, as would have been the case in this dividing mouse or that, uh, fly, uh, that this developing mouse or the fly I showed you. Uh, and here are some of my favorite examples of post-mitotic control of cell growth by TOR. Uh, the liver, if you uh, feed or fast, changes in size, and this is due to changes in size of individual cells. You don't acquire cells or lose cells. Uh, in, in, uh, in muscle, as you all know if you exercise, your, your muscle cells uh, get uh, bigger, and this has been shown to be uh, controlled by, by TOR. Again, you don't change the number of muscle cells. Uh, interestingly, TOR has actually gone mainstream, broken into popular culture here, with this uh, product which you can find on the internet. Uh, and if you can read the label, it says FOXO, PKC, mTOR, all these things which, uh, this is a dietary supplement for bodybuilders, by the way, and uh, I'm sure the bodybuilders know exactly what all these uh, things are. Um, I don't actually know what's in the flask, I couldn't buy it uh, in Switzerland. Uh, uh, but uh, I suspect it's simply leucine is in there for reasons I'll come to later. So uh, back to more serious matters. Uh, in the central nervous system, there, is a, there are very dramatic changes not only in cell size but cell shape, and TOR has also been shown to control this. And someone's actually shown that uh, queen bees are, are bigger than worker bees because the larvae which give rise to the queen bee is fed this super nutritious royal jelly. Uh, and I'll tell you later that TOR responds to nutrients. So they're fed the super nutritious royal jelly, which uh, upregulates the TOR pathway in these larvae, which give rise to this uh, uh, larger bee. So TOR, uh, the take home message here is that TOR controls growth very broadly. And by broadly, I mean in terms of both organism and physiological context. Essentially any case in eukaryotic biology where you see a change in cell size, there's a high chance that TOR is, uh, is somehow involved. Now, how does TOR actually control growth? Uh, well, again, work from our lab and several other labs have shown that TOR controls a large number of cellular processes which collectively determine mass accumulation and thereby cell size. And these uh, cellular processes can be subdivided into two groups, the anabolic processes which TOR activates uh, and the catabolic processes which TOR uh, uh, inhibits. So TOR balances these opposing forces of synthesis and degradation, uh, and this is important, in response to nutrients. So the cell accumulates the 
the appropriate level of mass and size in response to whatever the level of nutrients might be. So now the question was, how does TOR control all these uh, different cellular processes? Well, there are signaling pathways, which uh, effector pathways, which emanate from TOR and intersect with these different pathways down here uh, uh, to control them. Uh, but we have, uh, and in some cases, we know what those effector pathways are, but uh, not in all cases. Uh, and here's where we were in, nine, in 2000, I would say. Uh, and this is a yeast cell, and you can tell because we have uh, two TOR proteins uh, here. Uh, but what I'm going to tell you uh, also applies to mammalian cells. And as I'll show you later, everything I'm talking about in yeast is conserved all the way to, uh, to, uh, to human. Uh, so uh, the picture that emerged here, and ignore all the individual proteins here, the picture that emerged from about 10 years of genetics in the lab is that uh, TOR signals through two major branches, which are two TOR signaling pathways, in fact. So we often call it a TOR network, not a pathway, because there's more than one pathway. Uh, and this pathway we refer to sometimes as the TOR2 unique pathway, because only TOR2 can signal through here. And this controls the actin cytoskeleton, which controls the secretory pathway, which determines where new mass is laid down the cell. So we view this branch as mediating uh, spatial control of cell growth. Uh, this branch over here uh, controls all these processes which lead to mass accumulation. Uh, and therefore, we view this branch as, uh, as mediating temporal control of cell growth. So that is what we think is the logic of having these two major branches of TOR signaling, is that they integrate uh, spatial and temporal control of cell growth. And of course, th these two parameters of growth have to be integrated for uh, cell growth to occur uh, properly. So this is where uh, having two TOR genes in yeast actually helped our analysis because we were actually able to see these two branches or these two pathways of TOR based on their differential requirement for the two TOR proteins. In other words, when we knocked out TOR2 alone, we lost this branch, but not this one, and we could see that. Uh, then we knocked out TOR1, so TOR1 or TOR2 can, can function interchangeably in this branch. So when we knocked out TOR1, nothing happened, because TOR2 could still uh, maintain this branch. Uh, and then we knocked out both TOR1 and TOR2 at the same time, uh, then we lost both branches. So if, had there been a single TOR in yeast, like in all other eukaryotes, when we knocked out that single TOR, we'd have lost both branches at the same time and never would have seen the fact that there are two branches. So this is where having two TORs uh, actually helped uh, our analysis. So this is where we were in, uh, in about the year 2000. Uh, but we still had many questions. Uh, for example, what determines the specificity of TOR? Why can TOR1 and TOR2 signal through uh, this branch, but only TOR2 can through this branch? And we also knew at this point that uh, RAP mice and FKBP uh, can inhibit this branch, but not this branch. And we know that FKBP RAP mice binds directly to TOR2. We'd originally defined that binding site genetically. Uh, but uh, so why can RAP, FKBP RAP mice seemingly bind TOR2 here and inhibit it? Uh, but not TOR2 over here and inhibit it. Uh, now, a major breakthrough occurred in 2002, which uh, provided answers to these questions. Uh, and this was uh, the identification of two uh, TOR complex, which we discovered now by biochemically purifying the TOR proteins directly out of yeast cells. And we call these two complexes TORC1 uh, and uh, TORC2. So when we had these uh, complexes purified in the test tube, we sequenced the proteins. We used that information to isolate the genes. Once we isolated the genes, we could knock them out. And once we knocked them out, based on the phenotype, we could assign them their, to their uh, position, functional positions in this uh, TOR signaling network. And what we found was that the two complexes corresponded, TORC2 corresponded to this branch, and TORC1 uh, corresponded to this branch. So the two complexes corresponded to our two previously uh, defined branches of TOR, uh, of TOR signaling. So this was a, a very gratifying moment in the lab because it was the convergence of many years of genetics defining the two branches and biochemistry into this unified model of TOR signaling, uh, uh, which we sometimes call the two branches, two complexes model uh, 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 of TOR signaling. And of course, the, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this convergence of genetics and biochemistry, the biochemistry and the, and the genetics cross-validated each other, so we have a high, very high level of confidence uh, in this model of, of TOR uh, signaling. Uh, uh, so 
the, uh, 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 isolating the two uh, TOR complexes was, uh, of course, a, a biochemical uh, uh, approach, uh, which required spending a lot of time in the coal room. Uh, and very fortunately, I had at that time a, a postdoc who was used to the cold because he was a Canadian. Uh, and in fact, he was uh, uh, my first Canadian postdoc. Uh, he's actually uh, from uh, Ontario. He did his uh, PhD uh, in Calgary. And he's the, uh, the person who uh, isolated the two TOR complexes. And I'm proud to say he's now a, a full professor at the University of Geneva uh, in Switzerland. So um, once we had these two complexes identified in yeast, we, of course, wondered whether the complexes would be conserved all the way to human uh, like TOR itself. So we started looking in the, in the, in the genome databases, which uh, were available in those days, and, uh, and these databases were very incomplete uh, at that time. And we found some proteins which seemed to have some, some degree of similarity with the proteins which make up these two co uh, complexes uh, in yeast. So we started working on, on mammalian cells uh, uh, to, uh, to ask whether the complexes are, are conserved. But the majority of the work in this area was done not by us, but by David Sabatini at uh, MIT and uh, Kunyan Guan at UCSD and the late uh, Kazuo Yonezawa uh, in Kobe, Japan. Uh, and what we all did uh, together was to show that, uh, indeed, the two complexes are conserved all the way from yeast to human. Uh, in human, they're called mTORC1 and mTORC2 for mammalian uh, TORC1 or TORC2. Uh, they control many of the same, they phosphorylate many of the same substrates to control many of the same uh, processes, and like in yeast, they respond uh, to, uh, uh, at least TOR complex one responds to nutrients. Amino acids in particular is the best nutrient activator, and among the amino acids, leucine is the most effective activator, which is why there was probably leucine in that flask for the, uh, for the bodybuilders. So the picture that emerged now, and this is, uh, 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 I would say, uh, about 10 years ago, is that the uh, TOR signaling network uh, is, uh, is a primordial or ancestral uh, network cons conserved throughout eukaryotic evolution to control this very fundamental process of cell growth. Now, uh, that statement's not completely true because this part of the network, which uh, Luke Cantley very nicely uh, told you about in the uh, previous talk, uh, and as he said, this, this evolved later. This evolved with multicellularity and was then grafted onto the more primordial uh, TOR signaling pathway. And the reason for that is that uh, growth control in metazones or multicellular organisms is more complex than unicellular organisms such as yeast because in metazones, it's, it's key to coordinate the growth of every cell in the body with every other cell in the body such that our organs end up being properly proportioned. So in, mel in metazones, you need an input which controls growth over a whole body plan. And that uh, then is what growth factors provide, signaling through the PI3 kinase uh, pathway. So we now know in metazones, the inputs which activate TOR and growth are growth factors, uh, uh, nutrients, and we now also know uh, energy in the form of ATP. So once these three uh, uh, factors are, are present, the TOR signaling network is upregulated and you uh, have growth. Now, another fascinating aspect about the TOR signaling uh, pathway is the, uh, or network, is the large number of, of diseases which have been linked to it, uh, have been linked to it genetically. Uh, and all these uh, diseases have in, in common is that they are characterized by ectopic or inappropriate cell growth. And these can be uh, uh, malignant forms of cell growth or benign forms of cell uh, growth. Um, but in all cases, uh, cell growth. It's actually been calculated, and I think uh, Luke Hantley showed you this data, that uh, 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 TOR, well, he, sh he suggested that TOR contributes to 70 tumor genicity in 70% of all tumors. So more recently, TOR has been uh, uh, implicated in another set of disorders, the so-called metabolic disorders, uh, and we know that uh, chronically high circulating levels of nutrients, or amino acids, can upregulate TOR even in the absence of growth factors, uh, and this can uh, lead to adipogenesis, which in turn uh, can lead to uh, obesity uh, and in turn type 2 diabetes. Now, a more direct link between uh, TOR and diabetes is this famous negative feedback loop in the TOR uh, network where TOR and S6 kinase, the downstream 
uh, effector of TOR, phosphorylate IRS in the insulin pathway to inhibit it. And this, of course, then leads to uh, uh, insulin insensitivity, which is one of the hallmarks of type 2 diabetes. Uh, so this uh, is interestingly uh, provides a molecular link between uh, uh, diet and insulin, and, and diabetes rather. In this context, some have actually proposed rapamycin could be used as an anti-diabetic drug because if you inhibit TOR, you'd inhibit the negative feedback loop and you'd restore signaling through the insulin pathway. I don't think any companies actually, any, any uh, drug companies actually developing rapamycin as an anti-diabetic because there are other complications that uh, would prevent this. But uh, proof of principle for this notion comes from the fact that uh, the world's most commonly prescribed uh, anti-diabetic is metformin, which acts at least in part by activating AMPK, which uh, 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 then uh, 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 inhibits uh, uh, mTOR. Now, a, another work, by the way, which was done by, by Lou Cantley. Now, uh, the, another uh, fascinating aspect of the TOR signaling uh, network uh, is that uh, um, uh, rapamycin, or TOR, controls lifespan. Uh, and this was first shown in worms about 10 years ago, then in yeast, and then in flies, uh, in this paper in 2009 uh, in, in mice. And this was even done with old mice, equivalent of 60-year-old for humans, uh, which I, I think is, is quite astounding. Now this finding is causing a great deal of excitement in the aging field because it's been known since 1935 that dietary restriction extends lifespan. But the molecular mechanism of that has been unknown. Uh, and now we know that TOR is a nutrient sensor, and the effect of rapamycin is to inhibit a nutrient sensor and to induce the cell to think it's starved or dietarily restricted. So the, uh, the working models uh, in the aging field for how dietary restriction extends lifespan after some 70 some odd years of research uh, suggests that the way dietary restriction extends lifespan is by downregulating TOR, which leads to broad metabolic changes in the cell, which uh, somehow have a beneficial effect to extend a lifespan. So this is where we were about uh, five years ago. At this stage, we had a, a rather good understanding of, of TOR, its regulation, how it controls growth in a single cell. But then uh, there was a paper published about this time by another fly geneticist by the name of Pierre Leopold, who works in France, uh, which I thought was a, a, a remarkable paper. And what he did, he was, he was looking for mutant flies, which had a growth defect, much like Tom Neufeld's fly, which I showed you earlier. So he was looking for smaller flies. And what he obtained was a mutant which was defective in an amino acid transporter, which was specific to this one tissue, which is the fat body, which is that same tissue I showed you uh, when I was showing you Tom Neufeld's fly. Uh, and uh, because uh, this is an amino acid transporter, amino acids didn't get into the cells of this one tissue. Uh, they did because the other tissues don't rely on this amino acid transporter, and these are all the other tissues. Uh, and what he found, and what was completely expected, was that because amino acids didn't get into the cells of this tissue, TOR wasn't activated in, the, in that tissue, the cells of the fat body of this tissue were smaller, and the fat body itself was smaller. No surprise. But the big surprise was that all the other uh, tissues, where, which were not affected by the mutation this amino acid transporter uh, were proportionally smaller to match the smaller uh, fat body. So this was remarkable because it suggested that there are TOR-dependent signaling pathways uh, between tissues to control body, to control growth over a whole uh, body plan. So this opened up whole new vistas or whole new problems about how growth should be controlled at least on a whole uh, body plan. And uh, uh, it goes beyond just understanding how growth of a single cell is controlled. It tells us there's some higher order control which coordinates growth over a whole body plan, uh, which was completely unknown. And this is what we wanted to pursue next, not in flies, uh, but in mice. Uh, so what we did was we created mice where we could uh, conditionally in inactivate TOR complex 2 or co TOR complex 1 by knocking out the Richter gene, which is an essential and specific subunit for TOR complex 2, or the Raptor gene, which encodes a, uh, an essential and specific subunit of TOR complex 1. 
So that's uh, what we did. Uh, we were able to knock out these two uh, 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 genes or proteins in our tissue of choice. And the idea here was then to look at the function of TOR in all the different tissues to find out how tissue-specific TOR is contributing to whole body uh, growth. And then the question is what tissue to focus on. And we decided to, to focus on metabolic tissues, uh, fat and liver in particular, because these are the tissues which are most insulin sensitive, most nutrient sensitive, and controlled energy homeostasis in the body. And these are precisely the same three inputs which control TOR signaling. So we reason that uh, TOR the TOR network would have a particularly interesting or important function uh, in these uh, tissues. So let me, just to conclude, let me uh, give you uh, a taste of what we're seeing with this kind of analysis, and I'll just give you some results uh, from adipose tissue. So this is what we see when we knock out TOR complex 1, specifically in, in fat, so only in adipose tissue. Uh, and these mice turn out to be uh, resistant to diet-induced obesity. These two mice had the same diet, but this one's still doing fine. And in fact, this mouse uh, turns out to be even healthier than wild-type mice. So insulin levels are low, cholesterol levels are low, all metabolic parameters are even better than wild-type mice. So this told us that uh, in line with what Pierre Leopold showed before, that there are non-cell autonomous functions of TOR. So TOR in one tissue or one cell can control growth or metabolism in, in distant cells or distant uh, tissues. Uh, again, uh, suggesting that uh, there was uh, a, a great deal of new information to be gleaned from studying TOR in different uh, tissues. This also raised the interesting uh, uh, point about growth uh, uh, lifespan control. As I told you, reducing TOR extends lifespan, but then this uh, begs the question, it is reduced, does reducing TOR in a particular tissue have a particular beneficial effect to extend lifespan? Now, given that uh, uh, these mice seem to be healthy in wild-type mice, we think adipose tissue is one of the target tissues in which TOR has to be uh, uh, inhibited uh, to extend uh, uh, lifespan. We haven't done the experiment to test that. I haven't been able to convince a student to do it because the, the lifespan of the experiment is longer than the lifespan of the student. Uh, now, here is uh, what we found uh, in TOR complex 2, which I found was, e I thought was even more interesting. We found that when we knocked out TOR complex 2, so the previous was TOR complex 1, if we knock out TOR complex 2 uh, in adipose tissue, very surprisingly, the mice are even bigger, are bigger uh, than wild type mice. And this isn't due to an increase in adiposity, this is due to an increase in lean mass. And this then led us, led us to discover a, a regulatory, a feedback regulatory circuit, uh, which we are now trying to understand in more detail, where uh, uh, TOR2 in fat negatively controls the liver and its production of IGF, and also negatively controls uh, beta cells and their production of insulin to control whole body growth and, and, and metabolism. That's why we're knocking out TOR complex here, uh, we relieve this uh, negative regulation, we upregulate IGF insulin signaling, and we get uh, met, uh, systemic growth, as you see in this larger uh, mouse. So again, in line what Pierre Leopold sa showed in, in flies, uh, TOR in one tissue can affect growth over the whole body uh, plan. We think the physiological uh, reason for this circuit is that uh, TOR itself is IGF insulin sensitive. So this uh, is a mechanism of maintaining uh, IGF insulin homeostasis. So when there's very high IGF insulin, uh, activates TORC2 in, in adipose, which then negatively regulates liver and pancreas to reduce IGF insulin signaling. Okay, so that's something we are pursuing along with uh, knocking out TOR uh, in other uh, tissues. Now, I think I've come to the end of my time, and I'd like to uh, just uh, conclude by showing you a slide of some of the key members of the lab over the years who've done this work, uh, starting with uh, Joe Heitman, who isolated the original mutants, and, and Robbie, uh, who uh, purified the two TOR complexes uh, from yeast. Okay, thank you for your attention.